This is Dateline News and Conversation, a special report with our friend Dimitri Lascaris reporting from Canada. Today was a historic day. The International Court of Justice in The Hague voted 15 to 2 to, I guess, accuse Israel of genocide. But for an in-depth look and explanation to what happened today and what it means and what the consequences are going forward is our friend, Dimitri Lascaris. Dimitri, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Regis. Always a pleasure to talk to you. So, Dimitri, before we go into it any further, I think a lot of people are confused between the ICJ, International Court of Justice, and the ICC. And it was the ICC that I think made a judgment about Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. and, and accused him of kidnapping children or whatever. Can you just briefly explain the difference between the two before we get into this judgment today? Sure. So the International Court of Justice, which is the court that ruled today, uh, is a creature of the United Nations Charter. It's part of the United Nations system and uh, subject to any reservations that members of the UN might make. Uh, it has jurisdiction over disputes between states uh, that are signatories to the United Nations Charter, which uh, I think every state on earth is a signatory to the UN Charter. There might be one or two that aren't, but certainly uh, Israel, the United States, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, and you know, essentially all states are signatories to the UN Charter. It is the highest court in the United Nations system. Um, and because they're signatories to the UN Charter, there can be no dispute from countries like Israel or the United States that they are bound by the decisions of the ICJ. The International Criminal Court uh, is the creation of a separate statute uh, or treaty called the Rome Statute. Uh, and there are a number of states that are not signatories to that uh, treaty, that convention, uh, including Israel, uh, the United States, the Russian Federation, and China. Uh, so it's a much smaller, uh, sub significantly smaller number of states that are signatories to and potentially bound by the decisions of the ICC. Also, another important uh, distinction is that whereas the International Court of Justice adjudicates disputes between states, the International Criminal Court prosecutes uh, alleged violations of international law against individuals and can actually has the power uh, to order their imprisonment. Uh, and one other thing I should add, um, you know, in relation to what you just said, Regis, is that the ICC, it did, its prosecutor did file an indictment against Vladimir Putin, but there has been no adjudication of that claim uh, by the ICC uh, as of yet, not even a preliminary adjudication. What we have is an indictment, an unadjudicated indictment against Vladimir Putin. Okay, thanks for that. That clears that up in my mind, and I hope for a lot of other people. Today, the International Court of Justice, in what I think is a historic judgment, came down 15 votes to two. 17 judges sit on this panel against Israel, demanding a ceasefire and demanding another a number of things that they do in terms of um, the genocide that is going on in Israel. First of all, tell me who is on this court, how are they selected, and then we'll get to talk about the judgment that they filed today. Well, the judges are appointed by the member states. Uh, we don't really need to get into the, uh, I think, the particulars of that process, but who is on this court is definitely important. And uh, the president of the court, uh, who's, uh, you know, although 
she has as president significant powers that other members of the court don't have. Uh, she has her vote counts uh, for the same weight as that of any other judge. And that president is Joan E. Donahue from the United States, uh, who served in the U.S. State Department. I believe it was under the Obama administration and was supported uh, for her position at the State Department by uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, so this is not a judge you would expect to be sympathetic uh, to the Palestinian people and antagonistic to Israel. The vice president is Kirill uh, Givorgin of the Russian Federation. And the other judges, uh, normally, by the way, there's 15 judges. For this decision, there were 17. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, but the other judges are from Slovakia, France, Morocco, Somalia, China, Uganda, India, Jamaica, Lebanon, Japan, Germany, Australia, and Brazil. So I just want to highlight the, the judges who are from Western states or Western aligned states. We're talking about Australia, Germany, Japan, uh, France, the United States, and Slovakia. And uh, with the exception of Britain, which doesn't have a judge on the court at this time, I think we can say that those states, the US, France, uh, Australia, and Germany are the staunchest supporters, certainly amongst the staunchest supporters of Israel on the international stage and have been for a long time. Every one of those judges voted in support of this decision today. Uh, now, the, there were two additional judges appointed. Uh, in, a, in a case of this nature, uh, it is possible for, one, for a party to the dispute uh, to say, well, we want to have an additional judge appointed for purposes of this dispute. We call those judges ad hoc. Israel exercised that option, and because it exercised that option, South Africa also had the option of appointing an ad hoc judge. So we ended up with not 15, but 17 judges. Um, and the judge chosen chosen by Israel, by, interestingly, is uh, his name is Aharon Barak. Uh, he was the former uh, president of the Supreme Court of Israel, and I think it's fair to say is the most respected Israeli jurist in the history of Israel. Uh, now, I, I personally, you know, we can get into this if you want. I personally have serious uh, criticisms to level against Aharon, Aharon Barak and the entire Supreme Court of Israel. I think that the West is far too generous in terms of characterizing this as a a court committed to the rule of law and due process and equality and democracy. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that he was, uh, you know, he, I think it's fair to say the most reputable judge uh, that Israel has produced uh, in its existence. So this judge, the South Africa, uh, the, the Israeli judge disagreed with not all, interestingly, not all of the decision, but the most important part of the decision, in my opinion, and that is the determination that it's plausible that Israel is committing genocide. Uh, and the only other judge who disagreed with that conclusion was, interestingly, the judge from Uganda. Uh, but no Western judge uh, disagreed. And the judge from Uganda is a woman. I looked it up. I'm looking at this online right now, who, are, who all of these are. Why would Uganda vote against this? Yeah, her name. Her name is Julia Sebutinde. Uh, look, I, when I saw that today, I did a little bit of investigating into the relations between Uganda and Israel. Um, you know, I don't. I'm no, by no means an expert on that subject. I don't think it's fair to say that Uganda has been, uh, you know, unduly supportive of Israel over the years. Uh, it's not been particularly hostile either. It comes as a bit of a surprise that she would have uh, ruled against uh, Israel uh, or against this determination that Israel was plausibly committing genocide. But the fact of the matter is I'm not really in a position to comment on that because I haven't been able to get a copy of her dissenting opinion. Uh, so usually in a situation, it's, it's, it's typical that where a judge disagrees with the decision of the court, they will file their own opinion where they explain why they disagreed. Uh, I'm guessing it may be that the basis of her disagreement wasn't on the, the, the sort of 
the, the, the substantive question of whether Israel is plausibly committing genocide, she might have disagreed with the decision because she didn't think that the ICJ had jurisdiction to hear it, uh, which is a kind of technical matter. So she might not have even gotten to the question of whether Israel was plausibly committing genocide. I just don't know, and I won't be able to say anything about that until I read her dissenting opinion. Okay, thank you for that. Now, I was really confused as a layman about all of these conditions that had to be met for something to qualify or classify as genocide. Can, can you explain that for me and others in layman's terms? What, what did all of that mean? Well, basically, the definition of genocide, it's not overly complicated. It's in Article 2 of the uh, Genocide Convention of 1948. You can easily find that online. And just briefly, um, genocide in international law means the commission of certain inhumane acts, which include, but are, are not limited to, the killing of members of a protected group, uh, cr depriving uh, the members of a protected group of the conditions necessary to sustain life, uh, the imposition of, you know, mental harm on the members of the protected group and some other specific acts. And if you commit just one of these inhumane acts, you don't have to commit all of them, the five that are listed in the convention, uh, and you do it with an intention to destroy in whole or in part uh, the protected group, uh, then you are guilty of genocide. Uh, now, when it comes to the, you know, the, the uh, intention, that the requisite intention, you know, as I mentioned, it's either in whole or in part. The courts over the years have interpreted in part to mean a substantial part of the protected population, a part of the protected population that is sufficiently large that its destruction will have an impact on the entire group. Uh, so one of the questions the court had to deal with here was, uh, you know, is the intention or the evidence of intention to destroy the group, uh, you know, would that constitute or be, uh, would, would that evince an intention to destroy a substantial part of the population? And the court determined that, yes, the evidence at this stage suggests that the intention is to destroy a substantial part of the, uh, the Palestinian population. But that's essentially the definition of genocide. And uh, I've been saying from day one that I think it's a slam dunk that this definition uh, has been satisfied by Israel's conduct. Yeah, um, as I understood it, when when uh, this uh, American president of the ICJ read all of this, and she got to that part about what qualifies as genocide, I went, "Damn, this is a slam dunk." I mean, anybody, anybody who wants to look at this objectively over the last three months, a hundred days, has got to admit that. This has all taken place and continues to take place in Palestine, in Gaza. I mean, the, the, it's all over the YouTube. Millions of people around the world are protesting. Uh, it, it's really been amazing. And I think people have been in great anticipation for this judgment. Now, when it comes to intent, this is the part of the judgment or the reading of this judgment that I really thought was important. The court, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, made it clear that with testimony from Netanyahu himself, other members of the, the uh, Knesset, uh, other people in Israel have indicated that this was their purpose. I mean, that has been so clear. I mean, it's all over YouTube. Can you comment on that? It's astonishing how open uh, the leaders of Israel have been about their intention to destroy uh, Gaza, which clearly constitutes a substantial part of the population, uh, the Palestinian population. Um, you know, and, and, and South Africa's meticulously detailed 84-page brief uh, there was page after page of statements coming from the whole spectrum of the Israeli political elite 
uh, and members of the Knesset and media organizations, pundits, where they're openly expressing uh, their uh, bloodlust for the destruction of the Palestinian people, and particularly Gaza. Uh, it's, you know, normally when people engage in behavior of this level of criminality, they have at least uh, the minimal rationality to try to conceal or obscure what their objectives are. But here it's almost as if the Israeli political elite has been trying to hang itself. And I mean, there was so much evidence in this regard that uh, the court con confined itself to only a few examples today. And I want to highlight one in particular. Uh, they gave uh, examples, uh, they, they cited the Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Uh, they cited the uh, Minister of Energy and Infrastructure. But the most important one, from my perspective, is they cited the Israeli President Isaac Herzog. Isaac Herzog was quoted uh, as saying by the president of the ICJ today, uh, the following, uh, we are working operating militarily according to rules of international law unequivocally. That of course is nonsense. And he goes on to say, it is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It is absolutely not true. They could have risen up they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. So what Herzog did when he said this, and this was at the very outset of this uh, sadistic, barbaric military campaign, he was essentially saying that there are no innocents in Gaza, one half of whose population is children. And even the adult civilians, I mean, there's no basis whatsoever to say that these people could have, you know, uh, prevented Hamas from being the rulers of uh, Gaza. Uh, that is a highly dubious proposition, even if we're talking only about adults. And furthermore, if you extend that reasoning to Israel, okay, whose government is committing crimes against humanity, then every single person, every single civilian in Israel would be culpable and a legitimate target because they could have risen up against this government that's violating international law on a daily basis, committing more crimes and crimes against humanity on a daily basis. And because they didn't do that, they're legitimate targets for the Palestinian people. Why doesn't that uh, you know, absurd reasoning extend to Israel itself and to the Israeli population itself? Obviously it doesn't. Uh, this was a plainly genocidal statement in my opinion. And what I find really interesting is that this character, Isaac Herzog, is constantly presented to the public in the West as a figure of moderation and restraint in Israel. And in fact, only days ago, he was being feted at the World Economic Forum in Gaza, and uh, Davos, I should say, treated by all of these, you know, billionaires and, uh, you know, members of the financial press, these obsequious members of financial press as a respectable figure. And here we have only days later, after Davos, the ICJ citing the words of the president of Israel himself as evidence of genocidal intent. I think that's really just a raging indictment of the uh, the financial elite uh, and the political elite of the West. Wow. You know, as I listen to this today and as I'm listening to you now describing this, I'm, I'm getting this really emotional reaction, this unqueasy I shouldn't say angry, queasy reaction in my stomach. I mean, I'm feeling this. Uh, not that I haven't felt it as I've, I've watched all of this unfold, but with the report from the ICJ, I just was very, very moved. Um, you know, this is not the New York Times. It's not the Washington Post. It's not the Economist. This is judges from all these countries coming down with this condemnation of what is going on in Palestine. Now, I have a couple of other questions that I think need to be answered. Dimitri, in your mind, what does this judgment really mean? And will anything come of it? Uh, that is the key question, uh, Regis. And uh, so let's let's just start by reiterating that 
this is not a final determination that Israel is committing genocide. Uh, what we what what's what was sought by South Africa uh, was a uh, an order requiring measures or uh, imposing upon Israel obligations that would protect the civilian population of Gaza and stop the mass slaughter uh, and ensure that they have adequate humanitarian relief. So for purposes of obtaining that interim uh, relief or what they call provisional measures, uh, all they had to show was that it's plausible that Israel is violating the Genocide Convention. Uh, the question of whether Israel is actually violating the Genocide Convention will be litigated in the months ahead and will probably take years to determine because to make a definitive determination, they're going to need to look at a lot of sworn testimony. There's going to have to be cross-examinations. Uh, there's going to have to be forensic examinations done, which are not possible right now because of the conditions in Gaza. Um, you know, so so it just it's it's just a reality of litigation, especially when you're in, involved in allegations of this seriousness, uh, that the final adjudication will take years. And in the interim, you know, if you if you could only uh, protect the population once the final determination has been made, you'd never be able to stop a genocide. By the time the final determination is made, the genocide will have been consummated. So international law and the Genocide Convention is structured in such a way as to enable courts and authorize courts to intervene where there is plausible evidence of genocide, but a final determination has not been made. So that's what that's what's happened here. Uh, now, uh, I've been talking to you about Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, which defines uh, genocide. There's another article, Article 1, which imposes upon all signatories an obligation to prevent genocide. Uh, so it's not it's not simply that they have to punish it after the fact. They actually have to take positive steps to prevent it. And when is that obligation triggered? That obligation is triggered when there arises a serious risk that genocide is being committed. And this is something that an organization called the International Commission of Jurists uh, talked about in November. They issued a statement. These are 60 leading judges and uh, scholars and practitioners in international law. And they said at that point in time that there was a serious risk that genocide was being committed. And therefore, the obligation under Article 1 to prevent genocide had been triggered. Now that the International Court of Justice uh, has ruled that it's plausible that Israel is committing genocide, and, it, and particularly by a vote of 15 to 2, with all the Western judges lining up in support, nobody can plausibly argue anymore that the, ar the obligations under Article 1 have not been triggered. It is clear that the obligations under Article 1 have been triggered. And that means that every single state that is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, which includes the United States, which includes Britain, which includes Canada, the country where I'm currently situated, which includes Israel, have a positive obligation to take steps to stop the genocide in Gaza, to prevent that from happening. So it's no longer possible for any government as a result of this decision on God's green earth, uh, to the extent it's been supportive of Israel in the past, to just engage in business as usual. That's no longer, they cannot plausibly claim with a straight face that they're complying with their obligations under the Genocide Convention if they just conduct business as usual with Israel. They are now going to have to change in an antagonistic and adversarial way their relationship to Israel. Exactly what that means, you know, is a subject of debate. So will they have to impose economic sanctions on Israel? Will they have to sever diplomatic relations with Israel? Will they have to, at a bare minimum, stop sending weapons to Israel? Uh, will they have to take steps to prosecute leaders of Israel in their domestic courts for uh, crimes against humanity? These are all questions that have now been opened up, that have to be debated, that have to be weighed by every single government that is a signatory to the Genocide Convention, and they're going to have to do something. Else they will have no plausible argument that they themselves are are, are, com are complying with their obligations under the Genocide Convention. And if they don't do anything, if they just pursue business as usual, they themselves will become subject, subject to prosecution under the Genocide Convention for failing to comply with their obligations under Article 1. 
So I don't look, I, I don't harbor any illusions that the result of this decision is going to be a cessation of hostilities in Gaza today or tomorrow. Uh, sure, uh, I think we can anticipate that Israel is going to thumb its nose, nose at this decision for some time and the slaughter will continue. But this has changed the entire complexion of international relations vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And I think the, 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 the consequences for the state of Israel are going to be profound. It will take some time to play out, weeks, perhaps months, uh, but the game has changed decisively uh, in favor of the Palestinian people. You know, as you were explaining this, Dimitri, I, I was getting angry. You know, we got this legal mumbo jumbo. Well, it's not over. It's not definitive. It's got to go to a final judgment. And in the meantime, Israel is just going to continue, as you said, thumb their nose at this and continue the slaughter. The other part of this that really bothers me is, and I understand what you just said, all of these countries can be judged complicit in the genocide if they don't act to do something to prevent it. Realistically, Dimitri, do you see any of these countries, much less the United States, that will do anything significant to stop this? Yes, I think it is. I, I'm not particularly hopeful in the near term about the United States and Britain. Uh, I wouldn't rule that out, though, uh, Regis. Let me just say a word about the United States and the Biden administration. Uh, it was front page news in The Guardian which has done, in my opinion, a, an appalling job of reporting the facts about this genocide. Uh, it was front page news in The Guardian uh, a day or two ago that a poll in the United States just showed that 35% of Americans believe Israel is committing genocide, okay? The percentage who disagreed that Israel is committing genocide was essentially the same, 36%. Uh, and the rest were undecided. This is before the ICJ issued this ruling. And by the way, the percentage of Democrats who believe that Israel is committing genocide just before the ICJ ruling was about 50%. I think it might have been in excess of 50%. Now that the ICJ has rendered this decision, it is almost certain that the percentage of the American population, particularly Democrats who believe Israel is committing genocide, is going to rise dramatically. So the Biden administration is now confronting a situation. I mean, effectively, it is destroying, if it continues sending bombs to Israel, any prospect it has of re-election. I mean, right now, its pro prospects of re-election are hanging by a thread. But with this decision, uh, Mr. Genocide Joe Biden is in, stuck between a rock and a hard place because if he continues with business as usual against Israel, I mean, I think that he has almost no prospect of being elected. Uh, and that's something that's going to be of great concern to him because if Trump comes to power, uh, you know, and I'm no fan of Trump, but Trump is is going to be on the war path. And frankly, he has a lot of evidence at his disposal that uh, Mr. Biden and company were engaged in some extraordinarily corrupt activities, particularly in Ukraine uh, through his son, Hunter Biden. And he will pursue that evidence wherever it may lead. Uh, so he, you know, Biden has a personal stake in re-election. Not just his, you know, he covets power, which is obviously the case. He's always been a person who covets power above all else. But he's got to worry about the prospect of being prosecuted for corruption. He's going to want to win that election. And this decision is going to imperil his chances of winning that election unless he changes his policies towards Israel and Palestine dramatically. And, you know, what I find interesting is, is going on in the background here is that uh the press is reporting that in the last couple of days, Israel has made an offer of a temporary ceasefire. Uh, we don't have in, a lot of clarity on what that offer is, but what they're saying is they would stop uh, hostilities in Gaza for two months, uh, and there would be an exchange of hostages. During that time, Hamas would have to release all its hostages, and Israel would also release uh, some of his its hostages. What is not clear is how far Israel is willing to go. Hamas is saying you have to release all the prisoners, thousands of them. Uh, Israel has steadfastly resisted this. But the details of this offer aren't what is particularly important. What I think is uh, telling is that this offer was put on the table and it, it undermines everything Israel has been saying. Israel's position has been absolutist. absolutist. 
We will not stop this, this war until we have every hostage back. We will not stop this war until we've completely destroyed Hamas. It's just magically 48 hours before this decision comes out, Israel is resiling from all of that. They're saying we'll stop the war for two months if you give us back the hostages. Uh, and they're saying uh, they even offer it as part of this offer to allow the leaders of Hamas to leave Gaza. So they could be, would be given safe passage out of Gaza and they would be able to continue their activities, presumably from some other country. But they're no longer demanding that all these people be killed or surrender. Why is Israel, you know, all of a sudden showing this weakness? Well, I think part of the reason is because they anticipated that this decision was going to come out and it was going to be bad. And they're getting some serious pressure from the Biden administration to put an end to the slaughter. Uh, so, yeah, I think that the gig is up for Israel. Uh, and this decision is going to be a very important piece of the puzzle in terms of finally bringing justice for the Palestinian people. It's very sad and tragic and outrageous that, you know, there isn't going to be immediate compliance with this decision as there should be. Uh, but I still think it's a game changer. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the world of, uh, of, of pro-Israel advocacy will never be the same. Well, you know, from what I can tell, the people of the world have already spoken. Millions, tens of millions, who knows, maybe billions of people around the world are rising up. There's images and videos on, on YouTube of these massive protests that are taking place all over the world, including the United States. And I think this judgment is only going to embolden these groups. The people of the world have spoken and have judged Israel for what they've been doing in Palestine. In Palestine. I mean, this is humanity feeling the pain and the scourge of this, geez, unprecedented almost assault on a people that is completely defense, almost, well, the people are defenseless, except for Hamas, except for the PLO, whatever, but they don't have an air force, you know, they don't have nuclear weapons, etc. Now, I have... I say, say, Regis, I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. I mean, the, you know, the vast majority of people aren't lawyers, obviously. And uh, even lawyers, most of them don't really know much about international law. So, you know, when you're out there looking at these images of what is being done to the people of Gaza and feeling horror, you hear these pundits on television, particularly in the West, you know, in the media coming out and saying, oh, no, this doesn't satisfy the definition of genocide. You know, they they kind of hold themselves out as experts. And a lot of people don't know what to make of it, even though that they're, they can see with their own eyes something that's horrifying and appalling to them. You know, people are able to obfuscate these so-called experts, the legality of all of this. Uh, but when the ICJ, the highest court in the United Nations system, by a vote of 15 to 2, renders this judgment, all of a sudden laypersons they are emboldened because now they know. They don't need experts to tell them what is and is not going on in Gaza from a legal perspective. The ICJ has spoken. It is plausible that Israel is committing genocide. So yes, absolutely. I think this is going to reinvigorate to a degree that we haven't seen up until now uh, the already uh, elevated level of outrage and indignation amongst the peoples of this world about what is being done in Gaza. You know, that is another implication of this decision. It is going to have a massive effect on public opinion globally to the detriment of Israel's apartheid regime. Yeah. Uh, I, I, have, I have one last question, because this, this has bothered me since this began. Is this going to have any effect on the other neighboring Arab and Muslim nations who have, except for Yemen, maybe Iran indirectly, maybe Syria indirectly, will this have any positive effect, any, any effect on them to be more courageous in standing up now for the people, their brothers and sisters in Palestine? What are your thoughts? Look, these people, like if we're talking about, you know, the Saudi autocracy or the uh, the dictatorship in Egypt and so forth, these people have always had contempt for international law. 
So it's not going to directly impact them, but it will indirectly impact them for the very reason that you and I were just discussing. So in Saudi Arabia, before the ICJ's decision, a poll was done that showed 96% of the people of Saudi Arabia wanted the monarchy to sever relations with Israel. 96%. That's absolutely astonishing. This decision is going to increase significantly the hostility of the Saudi public uh, to Israel and its belief in the injustice of all of this and the illegality of all of this. And that in turn is going to place enormous pressure on uh, the Saudi autocracy, you know, the Egyptian dictator, all the governments of the Middle East uh, to take uh, at least more decisive action vis-a-vis -vis Israel, uh, because they're going to have to worry about, you know, the possibility of a social explosion in their own countries. This decision has increased considerably the risk of major instability at the grassroots level in the Middle East. Uh, so I think at least in that respect, even though they don't have any inherent concern for international law and the orders of international institutions, the impact this will have on public opinion in their own countries is something that will be of the utmost concern to them. Yeah, this is something that that I've always wondered about. You've got the governments who have really been beholden to the United States. Uh, on the other hand, I believe they've been afraid of Israel that, that had this powerful military, supposedly, but they had the bomb. None of them have had it. They've had to kowtow, in a sense, to the United States to play nice and not to unify as an as Islamic na nation or community. Um, and and I'm, I'm hoping that the people now, the people in these other countries will begin to realize this what's happening to them is the same kind of thing that could happen to their own population. Right. And so, I don't know, Dimitri. Um, I'm I'm hopeful, but I, uh, I I don't see this genocide, these attacks on Hamas, the attacks on Gaza. I, I don't see any of that stopping tomorrow as a result of that. What do you think? No, I would be astonished if it stopped tomorrow. But uh, I think that. Uh, within the reasonably near term, uh, which is to say, you know, within the next several weeks, uh, we may see a dramatic change in circumstances on the ground in Gaza for the better. Um, and in the longer run, uh, and I know this is little of little solace to the people in Gaza who are suffering immensely every minute of every day, uh, I think this has done uh, enormous good for the cause of Palestinian justice and self-determination. Well, you and I have talked about this, and you've said it very clearly. As, as another result of this and this judgment, the state of Israel has no future, given the reaction of the rest of the world and the judgment of this court. Well, you know, the, the, the defenders of Israel love to accuse those of us who criticize its human rights abuses of attempting to delegitimize Israel. Well, it wasn't us. It was Israel's own conduct and the decision of this court, which that conduct provoked, which has delegitimized Israel. Israel has been thoroughly delegitimized in the eyes of the global community now. Uh, and that, as I said, is going to have profound consequences for Israel and for the Palestinian people in the weeks and months ahead. 